We live in a world of mistaken identity where people are under pressure to become anything that people want. Unfortunately, if you do not know God, you can never know who you are because who you are is derived from who he is. So you want to rediscover yourself, the basis for your confidence, by the way. I was having a discussion with someone, I think it was yesterday or day before yesterday, and the person asked me and said, if there are two things you want me to know, what would they be? I would say, number one, pay the price to know who you are. If you do not know who you are, he was going to get into a particular sector, and I told him that is a vicious place. If you do not know who you are, and you get into that sector, you may become several things depending on whose mirror you are looking at. You look at the mirror of a loser, you will see something else. You look at the mirror of a defeated person, you look at the mirror of a mediocre, you look at the mirror of a champion, all kinds of people in life and destiny will flash different mirrors from the lens of their excellence or the lens of their limitations and they will want you to define yourself from the lens of their mirror. It's time to push away every mirror and look to the original authentic mirror as we behold him as in a glass. The Bible says we are changed. You look at the wrong mirror, you'll be correcting things you should not correct. It was the mirror that is wrong, not you. And yet you'll be forced to correct so many things. Are we together? You may be a patient and a kind person, loving and very temperate, but you will look at a particular mirror, a sociological mirror, and that mirror will interpret those attributes as foolishness and say you better change them if you want to survive. And a kind person will suddenly become a wicked person like a beast. And the mirror said, that's right, you are right now. Then you turn to another mirror and you see the mirror of a mediocre. And it says, what profit is there? Pressing towards a great life and destiny. It will bring you to a point of laziness and irresponsibility. And based on that mirror, it will judge you all right. Be careful before you assess yourself. Verify what mirror you are looking at. Our world today has all kinds of mirror. Society has their mirror. Social media, your social media has their mirror. My goodness, that one, they have a plethora of mirrors. Even Jesus, if he looks through that mirror, he may see himself with horns. <laughs> are we together now? Social media for you. Our world has mirror. Africa as a continent, we have our mirror. Culture has its mirror. We men of God and women of God, as leaders, we have our own big mirror that has been tampered and battered by religion. And everybody is presenting that mirror. And you have been assessing yourself using many mirrors. Let me propose to you that any mirror that is inconsistent with this mirror is lying to you. You will never truly know yourself. You will never truly know what you have. You will never truly know what you can do until you look to the mirror of scripture. You believe that? When you know who you are and what God has made you become, it becomes inconsequential what else people, time, sociology, whatever says about you. Are we together? Your confidence in life is derived from the stability of who you know you are in light of who Christ is. There is a, a cancer of mistaken identity that is eating up our world. And my, I feel sincerely, I'm a young man, but I feel for the younger generation coming, there is such confusion about identity. Listen, if you're a parent here and you have any children under 20, begin to pray and fast for them because this world right now is redefining people's identity. They can call a wise man a fool and the wise man will believe he's a fool. They can call a Christian a prey and the Christian believes he's a prey. They can call an intelligent person a dummy and he believes he's a dummy. Just because many people are saying the same wrong thing does not make it right mistaken identity we are raising a generation with no bankrupt of conviction people cannot stand to say listen i believe this about god and i believe this about me when you become that weak you cannot carry the latter rain because confronting the gates of hell 
will demand sometimes that you stand alone and in standing alone you must stand based on the consciousness of who you are the second thing I told the gentleman was I said if you want to rise the secret is not just productivity the secret is humility you can be productive but there is a limit to which you rise because skill can only lift you so far it is the hand of God that lifts men beyond the frequency of skill and productivity and according to scripture the secret to exaltation is that you humble yourself in the sight of God is that in your Bible and the Bible says he shall lift you who will lift you men cannot lift you God can use men one of the many things you need to run away from is pride let me submit to you that there is a healthy balance between confidence and pride there are many people in a bid to manage confidence they have tilted to pride it doesn't work that way you can be settled with confidence knowing who you are and yet you carry that air of genuine humility it is a powerful thing when you are great and humble when you are great and humble you become more marketable you become more delightsome people will always want to come because humility adds a garnishing to your skill it adds a garnishing to your greatness pride reduces the value of anything anything plus pride has its value reduced anointing plus pride will reduce the potency of that anointing a gifted person who is arrogant will reduce the power the impact pride is a diminisher at any level if you want to see exaltation in your life let humility become a code a creed a covenant that governs your life and I show you the way up and I show you the way to stay up number two what kind of men is God looking for in this end time the latter rain is looking for very specific people by the way I hope you know just to add to this that when we talk about those who desire to know God let me remind you that the knowledge of God demands your time demands your consecration and devotion demands your study of the word demands your fellowship with the spirit in prayer and worship let me repeat this again just to really wrap up and do justice to point one when the bible talks about men who desire to know god this is the implication men that are willing to give god time men that are willing to submit to the requisite consecration and devotion every mantle and every anointing has a consecration requirement you don't just carry the mantle you also embrace the responsibility of that consecration how about study of the word can i tell you i have not found any gift of study of the word in scripture the study of the word like prayer is labor the bible calls it labor in the word and doctrine it is not convenient your your stamina is built by the value you know you will derive for every time you invest in the word and then how about your fellowship with the spirit in prayer and worship you want to access the latter rain it will come on the wings of these including prayer and your time spent in worship now number two the latter rain and even God himself is looking for a man who will truly and wholeheartedly love him this is the second kind of man that God is looking for this is the second kind of man that God can use will use a man and a vessel who will truly write that down and wholeheartedly love him it starts with knowing God but it does not stop with knowing God the more you know God the more you love him love is enhanced by knowledge it is difficult to love properly in ignorance 
there are things that you can know that can make you or enhance your love the root of love genuine agape is that it is unconditional but it can be enhanced when you know certain things are we together there are things you know about god that makes you to love him more there are things you know about men that makes you to love them more john chapter 22 36 and 37 john 22 36 and 37 luke is did i get that right is it matthew let's try it my apologies i think i missed something now let's try matthew 22 36 37 master that's right please correct it is matthew master which is the great commandment of the law they were asking jesus and jesus said unto them koinonia let's read together one to go thou shalt love the lord thy god uh-huh with all thy heart with all thy soul and with all thy mind one more time jesus said unto him thou shalt love the lord thy god with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind the common word there is all all whatever facet of you it must be all of it not some of your heart mixed with some of your soul mixed with some of your mind it is all or never the business of loving jesus demands your all to respond to him god is looking for men and women who love him ephesians chapter 3 17 and 19 17 down to 19 that christ may dwell in your hearts by faith watch this now that ye being rooted my god and grounded in love uh-huh may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth the length the depth and the height 19 and to know the love of christ which passeth knowledge that he might be filled with all the fullness of God. God is looking for men who truly and wholeheartedly love him. Please shout that word love. Say love. love. One more time. Love. Most revivals died and most moves of God have suffered because the love component was not added to power. The love component was not added to miracles. The love component, self in most moves, replaced love. So the longevity factor in that move also died. There remained these three, faith, hope, and love. And the Bible says, your Bible says, the greatest of the three, faith that moves mountains, hope that maketh not ashamed, is said of the three, the greatest is love. There are three proofs from scripture that you love God. Let me give it to you. Buttressing on the second point. Don't tell me, apostle, I love God. Verify using these indices now that I'll recite for you. There are three biblical proof. There might be many, but I found in my study that there are three biblical proof that a man loves God. Are you ready? Number one, the first proof that you love God genuinely is that he becomes your priority he becomes your priority he becomes your priority that's the first proof that you love god he becomes your priority exodus chapter 23 to 5 he becomes your priority you're my treasure my priority who can compare to you great is the measure of your royalty oh morning star you truly are everything listen as beautiful as this song is for many people unfortunately it remains a song it is not a sincere experience what is the proof that you love god you want the latter rain to rest upon you that end time anointing to come upon you you want to be mightily used by god 
you must love God genuinely and wholeheartedly and the first proof is that he becomes your priority 3 and 4 Exodus 20 thou shall have no other gods before me thou shall not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or is in the water under the earth now look at this when you read this scripture religiously it's easy for you to feel you are free and you are guilty from this but you will be surprised how many people have made the same mistake of Nebuchadnezzar Nebuchadnezzar created an image of himself and asked men to worship it we still do that today as men of God we still do that today as businessmen it is very lucrative to create a stature of yourself this time around it may not be made with gold and silver but you edge it in the minds of people our pressure to be idols in the hearts of people is there is such a hunger there is such a panting to be the idol of people thou shall have no gods including yourself before me ministry can be an idol anointing can be an idol revelation can be an idol charisma can be an idol it's not only something you mold out of bricks and mortar it is not something you mold out of wood that cannot talk cannot speak and tie a red band around it no idolatry has graduated right now it has become a software that exists in the minds of people when I exalt myself more than Christ and I want you to remember me rather than Christ the celebrity mentality has eaten into the church eaten into us men of God eaten into business people our passion to be at the center stage you rather forget about God and remember Joshua Selman and because we spiritualize that idolatry we think it is right it is still idolatry you're my treasure my priority who can compare to you great is the measure of your royalty oh morning star you truly are the first proof that you love God is that he becomes your priority second chronicles let's hurry up 15 12 to 15 second chronicles write that scripture down and please do not forget it second chronicles 15 12 to 15 and they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart you see the word all again and with all their soul uh -huh, that whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death whether small or great whether man or woman 14 and they swear unto the Lord with a loud voice and with shouting with trumpets and cornets and all Judah rejoiced at the oath watch this for they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with their whole desire and my Bible says he was found of them and the Lord gave them rest round about God is looking for people who love him by making him the ultimate priority second how do you know that you love God are you ready obedience obedience is the second biblical proof that you love God obedience is greater than any sacrifice you will make Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12 obedience is the second biblical proof that you love God and now Israel what does the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God and to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all your heart and with all your soul say obedience John chapter 4 and verse 21 I like that scripture I found it many years ago and it's blessed me 14 21 my apologies John 14 21 it says he that keepeth my commands or he that hath my commandments and keepeth them 
He it is that loved me. He says, and he that loved me shall be loved of my father and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Apostle, I love the Lord with all my heart. Let me see your passion for obedience. If obedience is found wanting, your love for the Lord is found wanting. Are we learning? So the first biblical index to measure your love for Christ is not just professing, not just verbalizing, not just singing, that he becomes your priority in truth and in experience. Exalted above ministry. Exalted above your pursuit. I wish that were true for many of us. But unfortunately it is not. He's not yet priority. And then number two, obedience. Number three, let's hurry up. What is the third biblical proof that you love the Lord? Are you ready for this? Love for the brethren. The third biblical proof, my God, is the church so wanting in this area, so guilty in this area. Love for the brethren. First John chapter 4 and verse 20. Shout it with me when you see it projected, please. First John 2, 2 4, 20. Ready? One to read. If a man say, I love God, and hated his brother, he is a liar. One more time. If a man say, I love God and hated his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he had seen, how can he love God whom he had not seen? This is written in plain English. There are many proposed lovers of God having such a growing disdain and bitterness and hatred one for another within the body, in business, in ministry. The Bible says you are a liar if you claim you love God. And love and hate cannot coexist like that because perfect love does not just drive out fear. It drives out anything that is not love. Hmm. Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. Love for the brethren it says be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another you want to show that you love Jesus you must love his body I cannot claim to love the head and hate the body if I say I love you it will be stupid of me to mean I love your hair or I love your head if you discover what I've been saying is that I love your hair, you will remove the hair and drop it and say, go and love it there. Because that hair is not me. Am I right on that? I love your wig or I love your wivon. It's not the same as I love you. Huh? That's what many people are telling the Lord. I love the head. And that is because they have not met the head. By the time they see the head, they say, no, I prefer the body. I really hate the head. <laughs> Are we together? You cannot say you love God whom you have not seen and yet hate your brother. Let me show you something. Love is a very powerful force. I have learned this as a man of God. I have learned this as a believer. The Bible says love never fails. And when I talk about love, I don't just limit it to emotional affection. Are we together? If you are waiting for pleasant circumstances that create connection, your love will not be genuine. Because the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, undeserving, Christ loved us. Hallelujah. It is love that will make you to preach to somebody and you see that person and it looks like he will never be saved, yet you insist. It is love that will make you as a man of God to pay the price and labor, open your heart, teaching God's people the truth, whether you are rewarded or not. It is love that will make you wake up in the night while others are sleeping and you are praying and interceding for the people that God has brought your way. It is love that makes you to spend everything you have, your resources and your all. Everybody say love. A substitute to love is hypocrisy, religiosity, are we together? Psychophancy and all that are within that list. God is telling you that those who will receive the latter rain 
are not hypocrites. Not those who stand and say, I love you with hate and bitterness within their hearts. No. I hope you know that hatred is a signature of the presence of evil. Is that true? Yeah. The Bible says, do not be overcome by evil. But it says, overcome evil, not with evil. You overcome evil with good. Eternally, evil is more I mean, good is more superior to evil. It was love that defeated death on the cross. Love will always defeat death. Love will always triumph over hatred. Are we together? Ah, possible. But this one, just jump this. Oh, go to the third one. Let's round up. You don't know the situation around. I don't even want to tell you what who did what that person did ten years ago. The person slapped me in public, and I vowed that for as long as I'm alive, that hand must go. Look. Let me tell you the truth. The man talking to you is not stupid. Love will always triumph over evil love will make you look like a fool for a moment love will make you look like you are weak for a moment but step back and watch the power of love love raised christ from the dead love crucified sin satan death hell and the grave once and for all there is nothing love cannot do you have tried hate and it did not work try the way of love apostle but if i love people like that people will take me for granted when my head started getting hot, I started getting answers. Let me tell you the truth. Because I know Nigerians. Love is not as weak as you think it is. Maybe it is your definition. Are we together? I hope you know that judgment is still a subset of love. <laughs> so when I say love, maybe one day we'll teach on love. So that you will understand. Love has dimension. So length, breadth height width all is love but i can tell you love will always triumph over hate